Good morning, Ponds Church, and those visiting with us this morning. So glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Exciting to know that we can continue to pray for our, um, our services that are coming up, where we will um, slowly re-enter into worshiping together again. So glad to be with you this morning. Let's set our hearts on Him this morning as we go to the Lord in a prayer of invocation. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come this morning humbled by your presence. Humbled that we, um, although apart, can still come together and by your power of your, um, your grace and the common grace that you bestowed upon your people, that we can come into your presence this morning via um, online services. But Father, set our hearts this morning on you. Lead us to um, trusting you. Lead, to, lead us to um, acknowledging areas in our life, in our hearts, where we have not loved you, we have not loved our neighbor. Lead us to repentance this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Ponds Church. We are out here in God's church under the trees and the sky, praising him. And we just wanted to read the call to worship out here from Psalm 55. All right. And then the last verse, verse 22 that we do, we will do it all together. All right. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying, because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned from old, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them, because they have no fear in God. Ready? Here's the part that we all know. Are you ready? Say it with me. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Amen. All right, let's sing about that, everybody. Okay, everybody, we're going to learn the motions to a new song that actually the, the words are the same as the verse we just read in our call to worship. So we're going to learn some motions to the first part, which says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. There are some really big words there. Cast, you're going to take your hands like this and you're going to give it away. Cast means to let it go. Give it to somebody else. Cast. Cast your cares. Yes, cares. It's like worries. Like you're worried, the, the, the thoughts are just going through your head and you're so worried, you're worried, worried. So cast your cares on the Lord. You know, Lord, make your little L and come down across. So make your L and come down across. Make your L and come down across on the Lord. Yes, try it all together. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain. Sustain means that he'll keep you going. So put your thumbies together and push it out. He will sustain you. We're gonna do the sign for sustain. All right, let's do it all together. Are you ready? Cast your cares on the Lord. On the Lord, do the Lord, and he will sustain you. Push it out. And that's all we're gonna do. We'll just clap for the other part when it goes, he will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Okay, we'll just clap for that. All right? Thanks.
other and I need Go to the Lord and pray this morning. Our prayer of time will be led by um, Psalm 73, verses 25 through 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion.
forever. Father God, we come and we praise you this morning that there's no one else on earth. There's no one above the earth and under the earth that's greater than you. Father, we come and we praise you for your greatness. We come and praise you that there is no one greater and that we have, we have the greatest, we have access to the greatest one, our creator. Yet we um, seek to run after the wrong things. Our heart and our flesh fail all this week, all this time to run to idols that leave us empty. We confess that to you now. We confess that we don't believe that there are things, um, we believe there are things on earth that are greater than our Father in heaven. And we confess that to you. Father, we confess that we seek the approval of man over the approval of our God, our Father. The Spirit leads us and counsels us and reminds us more and more that our heart and flesh fail. And we confess that to you. We thank, thanks be to Jesus has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. We have forgiveness. And we also have access to our Father as he's the mediator for our sins. So we can come with these requests. We pray right now for those in our congregation struggling through miscarriage, through infertility. Lord, I pray that you be near to the brokenhearted. You be near to those that are struggling with the inability to um, have a child. Be sensitive. Be near to the in comfort for those that are hurting. Father, we pray for the D Church this morning. We pray for those that have grown up in the church and have left it because of the bride of Christ. Lord, would you draw all those people towards repentance? Maybe for some, the first time, towards true salvation for the first time. Lord, would you bring D Church people back to your, back to your bride? Father, they would see their need for community, their need for um, gathering together day by day, stirring one another up. Lord, would you be with them? Father, we pray for those um, hurting this morning because of the battle and the struggle with the injustices that are going on in our world today. We pray for racial unity, for reconciliation. I pray specifically for um, those hurting that are in the Asian American community who feel threatened by um, racial comments made by those in leadership of our country and along our social medias and our different um, relationships. Father, we pray for their protection, for that they would know that they are loved, number one, by you and by your church. Father, we continue to pray for unity of your body. We pray that we could be um, loving our black brothers and sisters and loving our um, community of officers and um, those passing legislation to help defeat um, racism in our, in our culture today. Pray that we would love our neighbor. We continue to pray for our church plant in um, Northeast Atlanta, pray for Grace Emanuel, pray for their meeting tonight. Pray that the fellowship and the re-engagement together um, would, would be sweet and full of grace and love. Um, use that time to continue to plant a church in Northeast Atlanta. Father, we continue to pray for your church that we would um, be wise in um, how we come back and worship together all again. Give your people patience. Father, we pray for those struggling with loneliness and isolation, that you be near to them. Father, we also pray right now that your word would be near to your people, that you bring truth, you would lead us to really admitting our failures, our brokenness, our sin, but that would even make the grace of Jesus Christ, the magnitude of God, your love and forgiveness and mercy towards your children and towards your people and towards this world. 
lead us to less of ourselves and more of you this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear now the reading of God's word from Psalm 85 to the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath and you turned from your hot anger. Selah. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Good morning, Ponce Church. Hope you're doing well today as we enter into a time of worship and uh, hearing from the Word of God. I um, wanted to share with you this past week, I had the opportunity to meet in two different groups of pastors, wherein everyone was sharing about how they were doing and really, to be honest with you, how they're struggling uh, just with life, uh, with their spiritual lives or relational lives. Uh, there's just this constant sense of just being uncomfortable. Uh, it's almost like a white noise. And uh, it just got me thinking uh, about how I think many of us are probably in the similar state right now, where we're living in a time of constant kind of gross feeling, right? A state that one uh, just kind of gets tired and you just want that feeling to go away. Uh, a scenario where no matter what you do, you just can't seem to get comfortable. And how could you? I mean, we've, uh, we're going through COVID-19 with all its disruptions and fears. We have been witnessing and experiencing the abuse of power with police and racial injustice and oppression. Uh, with, that we've seen exposed in our city and our country. Uh, we've seen the protests and the violence, the riots and the destruction and the terror, now the tearing down of uh, monuments. And there's such a, a constant feeling of um, being uncomfortable uh, that I think we're probably all feeling uh, in some form or fashion. And we've not even mentioned the personal struggles that we all are just dealing on an individual basis that we're wrestling with internally or relationally. And yet it's like our country and our city and world is kind of going through a, a kind of like a collective crying out uh, for change that we, we just want to get back to feeling comfortable, right? A screaming of voices and lives saying we are sick and tired of being uncomfortable with the pain of our society of getting tired of the uneasiness of living in a fallen, in a, a broken world. You know, our, our collective reaction to all of this mess reminds me when our kids were between the ages of like, you know, anywhere from one to five. Uh, and they would reach a part of the day where they could get pushed past their level of physical, emotional, or relational capacity. And when that would happen, it would usually become a tornado uh, of emotion, of crying. Uh, acting out with mom and dad or towards one another. And if we got to that point, that basically meant that the wheels were going to come off the family bus, right? It was just going to be uncomfortable. And at that point, it was up to mom and dad, if you will, to uh, be able to help alleviate those pressure points that were pushing them to the breaking point in their lives, that they were able to then settle down uh, and find somewhat of a a place of rest. 
And as uncomfortable uh, as these temper tantrums could become, uh, and I know they are for you as well, our children's responses actually kind of help point the way, I think, for us and how we handle this period, this season of our lives, where we're being pushed beyond the capacity of our own ability to deal with this feeling of uncomfortableness. You know, their responses remind us all that they cannot restore their worlds on their own. That despite their thinking that they can at times, uh, their restoration really is resting on their parents. They cry out to their parents. They ask and demand for help from their parents. They trust their parents implicitly based upon uh, learned experience in most cases where they see the character of their parents to follow through. You know, the same is true for us spiritually as we're trying to deal with the uncomfortableness that the world doesn't work the way we think it should or the way it should work. And we too are brought to the same decision our kids have to be made, are, are brought to. And this is where we have something to learn from you guys, kids, is that restoration does not rest in ourselves, but for all of us, it restora- restoration rests in the Lord. We need to follow our kids' uh, leads on how to handle the uncomfortableness of living in a fallen and broken world that doesn't really care about how we feel, doesn't really, isn't really concerned about our uncomfortableness. And so that we can learn to live life outside of the Garden of Eden. We too need to learn how to cry out for restoration. We too need to take on a posture of humility and teachability so that we can learn how to deal with our uncomfortableness. And then finally, we need to learn to trust implicitly the character of our Father in heaven so that we then can process through the emotions of dealing with our unsettledness. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and we give you thanks and praise that even though we are in this state of what just seems like a perpetual uncomfortableness, we know that you do all things with purpose and with meaning and for our sanctification, for our good, not only for ourselves as Christians, but for our city, for the world for all of humanity, that you are at work, you are doing things in the midst of this season of just the uh, uncontrollable. And so, Lord, help us to see how to process through that. Help us to learn from our children how we should respond to you as we seek to navigate through these periods. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our text today, we're the first, basically, three verses of Psalm 85 is, is the sons of Korah are hearkening back, if you will, to, to periods where God's people were in a state of blessing in the land and they were having peace with God, that things were good, that they, they use the word here of that they were, it was favorable. They were in a favorable place. It implies here that the persons were involved are, are experiencing approval or they're in the circumstances where they are in an advantageous position, right? And then it goes on to talk about here, the words here that, uh, to, that you restored the fortunes of Jacob. Another way of, of that phrase is used is that of that God has restored the captivity of Judah, of Israel. In essence, that to be captive to God is to be in a place of fortune, of blessing. You know, and it makes me think of our kids, you know, when they, uh, and the kids, you, you can attest to this probably to your parents right now, where, you know, you think about your best day, right? Maybe it was your birthday, it was sunny, or it was just a great day, your best friends are over, mom and dad have all their best snacks and stuff out there for everybody, and everyone is having a great time, and, and everybody's sharing and getting along. It's just that day, that great day. Right? Well, the sons of Korah here, are, they're remembering some of their former days where they experienced God providing them a beautiful, great season of life. And they, they, they talk about it in the language of for, that God forgave them, that he covered their sin, 
that he withdrew his anger and wrath from them and that he turned to them uh, to, in, in, in relationship to, to bring about a peace with God. See, this perfect day or state of blessing for the sons of Korah, unfortunately, doesn't last. Just like all play dates or perfect days, they must come to an end because reality has to set back in. The ideal just in a fallen world is not going to last. So how does the kingdom of God or the perfect day in God's kingdom get restored in our lives? And much like our kids, when they say that in essence, by the way they respond to their uncomfortableness, that restoration resides in their parents. Well, the same way that the kingdom is restored to us is that the restoration is of the Lord. It's in the Father and what he does. And we see this in three ways. And the first one is that we cry out for restoration. Or another way to say that is to acknowledge that we're not there that we're not in our best day anymore, right? Notice here in verses four through seven, he says, restore us again. And then later he says, will you be angry forever? And he he says, will you revive us again? And then he ends the passage with this deep longing for the, that God, would you bring, restore once again your steadfast love and salvation. He's longing for the restoration of the covenantal relationship that the Father had with his people. You know, when you think about the, all the issues of our day, we, we all have to confess that our churches and our cities are not in line with the heart of the gospel as it relates to the care of the image of God and all people. That's why we're experiencing a lot of the uncomfortableness and the tension that were happening in our city and in our world. And just like when our kids get upset, we too, we need to cry out for restoration. That that God would be the God of our salvation, that he would extend to us the grace for repentance and forgiveness, and that he would fill us with his life, his energy and power by the Spirit to care and to live according to his kingdom values. So we need to respond just like the sons of Korah, just like our sons and daughters when they get upset. Restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you. Show us your steadfast love. You know, it's, it's in these moments when we are feeling the lack of control in our lives, when the racism and the oppression that we see in our own hearts and in our society and our world, it's when we see the destructive and the violent elements in our, around us It's in these moments where we need to cry out. We need to acknowledge this is beyond our capacity. That we're no different than our kids and we're certainly no different than Israel. That we need to know that we need to be restored. And we go to the one who does that. The one who provided a blessing, the seasons where we had a good day in the past. We need him to do that again by giving us his presence One of the ways in which we're going to try to help our church in the days to come is to apply the crying out for restoration in particular because we're going to be trying to host a lament service in the the weeks ahead wherein as a church we're going to gather, we're going to worship, it'll be a special service where we're going to take time out to acknowledge that our our lives, our city, our world, it, it needs restored. And we need to cry out, we need to grieve, lament, and ask God to revive us once again. That will be a way for us to apply this restoring, crying out for restoration. Secondly, is we need to take a posture of teachability or humility. Or another way to say that is we need to acknowledge that we don't know how to get back to restoration in and of ourselves. 
Notice verses 8 and 9. He says, will you not revive? I'm sorry. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. I love the phrases there. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. And then later he says, salvation is near to those who fear him. Do you hear the posture there, the humility that I don't need to hear uh, my best thoughts of what I think is happening around me. I don't need to hear the thoughts of some other human being to do that. Instead, is that we need to hear from God. We need to hear what he sees, what's breaking his heart, and how it is that he wants us to respond in those situations. See, our, our doing this is acknowledging that we don't have the, the thoughts or the methods or the solution that, that's solutions that are sufficient to restore not only what's going on inside of us, but certainly what's happening around us to others who are suffering and hurting. But notice the result of what God promises. He says that he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, that his glory may dwell in our land. But beloved, that's the great hope for us is that as we come with the posture of humility and teachability, that we begin to give up on our trust in our own thoughts and best efforts and our best ideas, but instead we listen to God's ideas that God has spoken to his people throughout the ages via his prophets and his priests. But now the pinnacle of his communication is being made manifest in the birth and the life and the death of his son, Jesus Christ, the very word of God, the Lagos. See, when we begin to consider the disruptive elements of the fallen world and the current events that we're experience, uh, currently experiencing, we need to be asking ourselves, how does Jesus' life and redemptive work address the sinfulness of our hearts, of our churches, our communities, and the systems that they're a part of? The chaos of natural disasters, disruptions, racism and oppression, civil corruption, and Christians' involvement in the civil sphere. What would Jesus say to those things? See, these are questions that we need to begin to ask and really delve deeply into the Word of God to hear His thoughts, His heart, His mind, so that then we can obey Him and that He can bring His peace. He can bring His salvation both to us personally, but also to our world. For a point of application, like our children, we need to come to our Father to have Him to give us a heavenly outlook on the problems of our day. To outline for us a, a theological, ethical, ecclesial, and a civil framework for how we're to posture and practice our faith in relation to these issues in the broader world. See, friends, this word that we're given to read isn't just something that we read and it gives us warm feelings, though it does. But it's meant to give us an outlook so that we can then go and be doers of that word so that the kingdom can be felt and experienced by people out there, not just in words, but in how we live amongst them and for them. And that leads ultimately as we beg the question, okay, that's all great, Tolliver, but how can we trust God through this? How do we know that would be the right thing to do? What, why would we want to trust God in his word at this time? And ultimately, that comes down to the third point here of knowing that it's God who restored, that restoration is of the Lord, is that we trust the character of God. Or another way to say that is that we acknowledge only God has been there in our type of situation and knows how to handle it. Notice here in verses 10 through 13, the psalmist states, Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. 
righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Notice here that there's three things that he's revealing here about the character of God. One is the, the relational or the covenantal character of God. When he states here that steadfast love and faithfulness meet righteousness and peace, kiss each other. It's, it's this idea of relationship, of intimacy, wherein God's hesed love, his steadfast undying, never-ending commitment, his covenantal commitment to his promises meets with his faithfulness, where his righteousness and peace kiss intimately. See, beloved, the restoration of God doesn't rest with you. It rests in the character and the relational nature of who God is. Secondly, notice the spatial character that's revealed here. Verses 11, faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. You get this image, this picture here of God that the vastness of his faithfulness, the vastness of his righteousness, that there's no place that we can go where God will not be faithful, where he will not be righteous. It surrounds us. And then verse 12 and 13, we see the ethical character. He says, yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield, yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. So it's not just this relational character. It's not just a spatial character, but it's something that actually is uh, ethically applied. Where do we see that with God? We certainly see it all throughout the Old Testament, but we see that most clearly in the person, the life, and the death of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus actually lives out his character, his kingdom values, in the face of all of the subversive and oppressive people and systems of his day. Jesus is the ultimate protester, if you will. He speaks against abuse of power in the Gospels. He speaks against prejudice, corrupt systems, both civil and ecclesial. But he does all this in a nonviolent, a non-worldly way, is maybe the better way to put it. He does this basically, but one, by speaking truth to power. When he sees power that's being misused, he speaks to it and he speaks against it. We see it that he sacrifices comfort and connection with his culture for the sake of truth and for the sake of those who are broken, who are sinful, who are oppressed, and for a broken world. And instead of being destructive to the world and the people around him based upon what he sees, he sacrifices his very life for the glory and truth of God's law, his righteousness, and the passion to restore all things back to his heavenly father and to their intended purposes. See, all of this restoration rests in the character and the activity of God himself. And where do we see that most pronounced? We see it in the word of God, in the flesh, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as for a point of application, how do we apply this? See, friends, as redeemed people, blessed by this character and work of Jesus, our lives as a result will follow in a similar pattern. As we go to him crying out, we listen for his word and for his salvation, and as we apply it, what will happen? What will happen to us? Much like we saw with the disciples, they too began to speak truth to what? To power. They too began to sacrifice comfort and the connection with their culture for the sake of truth and for the sake of the broken and the sinful and the oppressed people of the world. And finally, they too sacrificed their very lives for his glory and truth so that all things, that all people might be restored. Not being disruptive, not being or destructive 
to cause injury, but being willing to give their lives for the broken of the world and of humanity. And beloved, this is where, this is where the, the call of being a Christian is very difficult. And I think sometimes we do a, disru- a, dis- a disservice to people that we call and challenge to b- put their faith in Christ. Because what they need to understand, what we need to understand it, is to follow Jesus means that we're going to speak truth to power. We're going to sacrifice comfort and connection for the sake of those who don't have it, who are hurting and struggling and oppressed. And that we too will take on his yoke, that we will sacrifice our lives for the good of the world and for others. I think the question is, is the world seeing and experiencing a suffering, sacrificial, and loving Jesus through his body? Is the world seeing a Jesus being manifested through his church that is crying out, that is seeking his word and truth and is seeking to trust in his character, to love the oppressed and broken of the world? I close with this. As I was thinking about a closing illustration, I couldn't help but think of Folks like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, India, Amy Carmichael of India, Corey Ten Boom of Europe and the Dutch uh, during World War II, all women who were followers of Jesus, who were convinced, persuaded, taught, and followed a Savior who spoke truth to power who sacrificed comfort and connection for the broken and for the world, and who sacrificed their very lives, put their lives on the line on a consistent basis so that others might experience freedom, that the others might have that great day, just like your kids get sometimes, just like we get sometimes. They knew that to follow Jesus meant to be a people who live their lives following after the Father to bring the ultimate, the great day of the Lord when all things will be made new and made perfect, not just for one day, but for all eternity. May the Lord help us to that end. Let's pray.
Now, Ponce, it's my privilege to bring you God's last word, a benediction, a blessing as you go out. Receive this benediction. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Have a great Lord's Day.